I'm gonna I'm gonna put this pointy thing down for a bit. I'll explain what the pointy thing is later. So I am a, I'm an observational astrophysicist, and and what that means is uh, I spend a large fraction of my time, many of my waking hours, studying stars and galaxies, and trying to understand what those can uh, teach us about the lives of stars, galaxies, and really the history of the universe as a whole. And these are things that are, you know, very far away, very very removed from our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and it's with, this, it's with this background, with this kind of motivation of who I am as a person, that, uh, that I want to motivate you to study all things. All things here on Earth, all things in nature, all things that you can actually ponder and try to understand. Because I would argue that everything that we can understand, everything that we can study, uh, should be studied. Because there comes great joy and great value by understanding things and studying them even if we can't really quantify that, and even if we can't really monetize that, there's an intrinsic value to that. And that's because I think one of the things that defines us as human beings is our urge to understand things, to, to study things, to, to, to have a deeper experience of them. And even if it turns out that we are just some accident of nature, that we were just created because the universe just happened to create us, not because there was some grand design, we just happened by chance, I think, as far as we know, we're the most powerful tools there are in the universe for actually understanding the universe that created us. We're the universe looking back on itself, people have said before, and we don't know of anything else that's better for understanding the universe than ourselves um, and all of the things that have been created besides ourselves in the last 13.7 billion years since the, since the Big Bang happened. So when you talk about studying all things, I think you're talking about exploration. So this is a talk mostly about exploration, studying all things and, 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 and doing this in an explorative way. And uh, I was a pretty nerdy kid. I spent a lot of time, for instance, looking over atlases and just studying the maps, looking at the contours of the maps and, and kind of dreaming about all of the countries that are out there, the different types of people, the different landscapes. But it occurred to me one day that, uh, that we've basically mapped the whole Earth. I mean, we could quibble about the, the bottom of the seafloor and things like that, but you know, we've mapped the whole Earth. And, and this kind of bothered me. This bothered me because I felt like the great, the great age of exploration was over. Um, so yeah, I used to think about other, other cultures, other places and whatnot with this mind of, uh, of exploration. Um, and as I became a teenager, it realized, um, you know, even though the Earth is completely mapped and even though we know of everything on our own planet, we're actually quite fortunate that the Earth is just a speck of sand in the universe, that we have this grand universe that we can study, and the exploration will actually never stop because the universe is, for all intents and purposes, basically infinite. So what I'm going to talk to you about today, really, it draws on my own personal research. I'm going to talk to you about something very specific that I've done in my own, own research as an astrophysicist, but um, I wanted to frame this as, as exploration, as, uh, the, as, as using the example that I'm giving you as a motivation to go out and study things yourself, to discover things, and, and to study things not because it's necessary to do so, but because you're a human being, because it brings you great joy. So astronomers, we study the sky, and one of the ways in which we study the universe is by using the light that's created by planets, by stars, and by galaxies. We're fortunate that this light arrives on Earth because that sends us basically a message. It sends us information about what's out there in the universe. We can't obviously travel to these faraway planets or, or stars or galaxies, but we can sit here and we can watch you know, the history of the universe arrive at our at our footsteps, and we can study that information to try and understand uh, what's out there and uh, where we came from. But light, light is not just what we can see with our own eyes. Light is also, um, x-rays are light, gamma rays are light, and radio waves, which I study as a radio astronomer, are also a form of light. So this image that you see behind me, it shows a number of specks of light from stars and from galaxies, but it also shows these big blobs, this kind of giant Q-tip on the sky. It kind of looks like a giant Q-tip. What that actually is, though, at the center of this image, there is a supermassive black hole. It's a black hole that's about uh, a few billion times more massive than our sun, so it's a really big black hole. And this red emission that you see there, those are radio waves, it's radio light, that we can only see with a radio telescope. And these are showing jets that are actually being launched out of this black hole. 
These jets are huge. They span a few million light years, basically the distance between galaxies, and they represent an enormous amount of energy coming out of this black hole. And the main point I want to make here is that we wouldn't know about this if it wasn't possible to observe radio waves and use them to study the universe. Now, radio astronomers like myself, we use uh, instruments called radio telescopes, which are very, very large satellite dishes, basically is one way of thinking about them. And we use this to study stars and galaxies and planets. And we do this, again, to study the, the lives of stars and galaxies, the history of the universe. We do this to understand the fundamental physical laws that actually govern the universe. We can understand fu fundamental physical theories, like the theory of gravity, by doing these types of studies. But we also do it because it, because it brings us great joy, right? Now, about 10 years ago, something very surprising happened. It's not so often in astrophysics that we find something fundamentally new that changes our thinking about what's out there. What was found using this Parkes Radio Telescope, which is a 64-meter dish in, uh, in Australia, a team of astronomers that was led by, by Duncan Lorimer, they discovered a new type of signal, which I'm going to be talking to you about today. The signal lasted only for a few milliseconds or so, so it was just a flash of radio light. It lasted a very, very short amount of time. And, and what was interesting about this signal is the properties of, of, of the signal, which I'll explain in, uh, in a few, uh, few minutes. The properties of the signal suggested that it came from very, very far away. So far away that whatever produced the signal had to be very, very energetic, otherwise we wouldn't see it anymore. So what does this look like? What they had found, it's now called uh, the Lorimer burst after Duncan Lorimer, the, the head of the team that discovered this, was, was this Lorimer burst. And when we use a radio telescope to study uh, the sky, we don't just measure one wavelength of radio light. We don't just use one color of radio light. We try and measure a whole range of radio colors. And we do this because if we use a whole range of colors, then we're more sensitive. We can look deeper into space. But this comes uh, with an added problem. And that problem is, if you look at many colors at the same time, you have an issue. And this issue is the fact that the speed of light, even though it's constant in a vacuum, space is not actually completely a vacuum. There is gas between stars and galaxies, and that gas between stars and galaxies affects light. And it affects light in a way that the longer wavelengths of radio waves, so you could think of that as the redder radio waves as opposed to the bluer radio waves, they actually arrive later. They're delayed by all of that gas between us uh, and, uh, and whatever is producing the radio waves in the first place. So even though Duncan Lorimer and his team, they saw this millisecond flash of radio light, you know, like someone you know, just flashing a, a, a flashlight at you, that light arrived much later at the lowest radio wavelengths or the lowest uh, radio frequencies compared to the highest. So it lasted for a few milliseconds but it took about 400 milliseconds for it to arrive at the longest radio wavelengths that they observed. So what? Why does this matter at all? Well, it matters because this delay, again, it happens because of all of the material between us and whatever produced that flash of light. And that means that if we have an idea for how much stuff is out there in general, we can use this kind of as a, a ruler, a way of measuring the distance between us and whatever produced this radio flash. And it turns out, and this is quite phenomenal, imagine that whatever produced this radio flash, this mysterious uh, flash of light, was at the edge of our own galaxy, at the edge of the Milky Way. Well, we would expect the signal to be delayed, but we would expect it to be delayed by only about this much. So the issue is, the delay that we see here is clearly much, much larger. And what does that mean? That means that the signal is coming from much further away than even the edge of our own galaxy. In fact, we now know that the signal came from about 8 billion light years away. So when the signal was created, there wasn't even a solar system. There wasn't even planet Earth. And in the time that it's taken to arrive to us, the solar system has been created, the Earth has been created, and all on life, life on Earth has evolved, and radio astronomers have been created, and they were there just in time to catch it. We don't know what it is. We still don't know what it is. There are many, many theories for what this could possibly be. And these theories are quite exciting because they involve very exotic types of astronomical objects. They involve black holes, they involve neutron stars, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but we have no idea what's actually producing these signals. In fact, 
this is a major bottleneck. We need a lot more data to try and figure out what's going on with these signals. Now, my colleagues, my international colleagues and I, a few years ago, uh, we achieved a breakthrough in this field. What we found, using the large radio telescope in Puerto Rico, the 300 meter wide Arecibo dish, which you might recognize from, from a James Bond movie, this was in a James Bond movie as well. Um, we used this giant radio telescope uh, to, to search the sky for this type of signal, and we found um, one of these signals that happens to repeat. So we see flashes of radio light, they're coming from the same direction on the sky, and they're coming from the same distance because each one of those signals has exactly the same amount of delay. So we know that uh, they're coming from the same distance and from the same direction. And this is what one of these signals looks like. So this is obviously an artist's conception, but this is using real data that we measured with this Arecibo radio telescope. So this blue line here is showing you the radio flashes that are repeating from this particular direction on the sky. Now here comes the pointy thing. This is also a representation of the actual signals that we were able to measure. This is a 3D model of one of the radio flashes. And basically what it's showing you is different colors of radio light, different times, and then how bright the signal was. Now, we want to try and figure out what these things are. Where they're coming from is a very important aspect of that. To know where they're coming from, we need to localize the direction that they're coming from very, very precisely. So it's very, very fortunate that we had found a source that has repeating bursts. Because there are repeating bursts, we can actually get the biggest, best telescopes in the world all pointed in that direction, and then we can wait for another burst to come, and then we can try and pinpoint the direction on the sky that they're coming from. Now, we had to be very patient. We had to wait many, many tens of hours and, and uh, spend a lot of observing time to finally catch one more of these bursts using this very large telescope in New Mexico. This is a very large array, maybe not such a romantic name for, for a radio telescope, but it is indeed very large. And importantly, it's an array, which means that it's a group of radio telescopes that can all work together. And when we combine the signals from multiple radio telescopes together, we can pinpoint on the sky the direction from which the bursts are coming. And again, this is critical to try and figure out what actually produces the burst. So we did this with this telescope. We also, we got a little bit greedy. Oh, we got a little bit greedy. We decided we want to know it even more precisely. So we used a network of telescopes that actually span the entire globe. We used a network called the European VLBI Array or European VLBI network. And this network collects radio signals from radio telescopes all over the Earth, and it sends them in real time, actually to the Netherlands, to the little village of Dwingelo, which is in Drenthe. So imagine you know, these signals from all of these dozens of, of radio telescopes all arriving in Drenthe, of all places. Um, and the reason we did this was because we could pinpoint the direction on the sky even more precisely. In fact, we could pinpoint the direction on the sky to one millionth of a degree. So that's similar to being able to resolve the size of a car on the moon. So you need very, very sharp artificial eyes to do this. So now you're hopefully waiting with bated breath to hear, well, what was in that direction? What is so special about that direction on the sky? Well, to answer that, we needed to use very large optical telescopes, so telescopes that can receive light that is similar to the light that we can see with our own eyes, because there wasn't much there. Whatever was there was very, very faint, so we needed a very, very large optical telescope to try and figure out what was in that direction. So using an effect called redshift, the universe is constantly expanding, and that means that when we receive light from far away in the universe, it's being stretched out. It's being stretched from blue to red. And by measuring this effect, in that direction, we were able to determine the distance that the bursts were coming from using a different method than we were able to do in the radio. And we found that these bursts are actually coming from three billion light years away. So it's a little bit closer than the first source that I was telling you about, but again, this burst, even though it lasted a few milliseconds, which is 100 times shorter than a blink of an eye, uh, was created three billion years ago when there wasn't even multicellular life on Earth. And what's in that direction? A tiny little galaxy, a puny little galaxy that's basically nothing compared to our own Milky Way galaxy. That's this little green dot here. That's where the bursts are coming from. And why does that matter? Well, this galaxy contains pristine gas. It contains gas that was created 
at the beginning of the universe, hydrogen gas that has not been polluted by any other elements. And what's interesting about that type of material is that type of material can form very, very massive stars, stars that are maybe 100 times more massive than our sun. So using the Hubble Space Telescope, we are able to make an even sharper image of this galaxy. And what we found was that this galaxy, once we're able to resolve it with the Hubble Space Telescope, actually has an area where stars are being formed at a very rapid rate. So many young stars are being born in that direction. And the source of these radio bursts is actually coming from exactly that direction. This is a critical clue. It tells us that something related to the formation of stars is producing these bursts. And what do we think that is? Well, our current model is that the source of the burst is not a very, very massive star, but rather what a very, very massive star turns into at the end of its life. So a very massive star, when it runs out of nuclear fuel, will actually collapse. It will have a supernova, which you've probably heard of before. And in a very extreme supernova, it can potentially produce a very, very extreme star in its wake. It can produce a neutron star. A neutron star is so dense, so extreme, that even a you know, a teaspoon of material from a neutron star would weigh more than every single person on Earth. And we think that this could potentially be producing the bursts that we're seeing here. We think that a very, very extremely young neutron star, a very, very magnetized neutron star, can be producing these radio bursts. I'm talking about a star that is smaller than Amsterdam, that uh, weighs more than the sun, has a magnetic field of about a thousand million million times that of a fridge magnet, and, uh, and also, after all of that, is probably younger than I am. It's maybe only 30 years old. So that's the end of my story for now. But the field that we're, we're opening up here, the study of this new phenomenon, is currently in, it, in its infancy, but it's actually accelerating as well. We're building new types of radio telescopes that are capable of spanning a much larger fraction of the sky, and which are going to be able to find many, many more of these signals. And we're hoping that there's going to be many, many surprises along the road, and that we can continue to study all of the things that there are in nature. Thank you very much.